Amen. Christ is all. He is all that you need. Is that true? A few amens. It's good to hear. Um, do we actually live that way? What do you really need in order to be happy, to be satisfied in life? Is Jesus really all? Well, this is the message of Colossians. Um, we've had a, a couple of weeks just at the start of the letter, and it becomes clear as you go through that this is the message of Paul, that uh, this is all about Jesus Christ. He is all and in all. You don't need Christ plus the law. You don't need Christ plus some other philosophy, as perhaps the Gentile opponents of this church are telling them. You don't need Christ plus all of the bells and whistles that life tells you you need in order to be happy. All you need for life, all you need for true freedom, all you need to, if I pick up on the language of the young people, all you need to live life as your authentic self and to live your best life now, whatever that means. Uh, all you need is Jesus. Um, so far we've talked briefly about Paul's reasons for, for writing the letter. He's heard news probably from his friend Epaphras about how well this church is doing. They're showing signs of growing into maturity in Christ. They're living by faith. They're driven by hope. They're walking in love. And we were told... Um, a couple of weeks ago, that uh, on hearing news that they're doing so well, Paul responds to that news by dropping to his knees and praying for them, pleading to God on their behalf. It's an interesting response. We tend to pray for people or for ourselves when things are going badly. But no, Paul hears that they're going well. So he drops to his knees and he prays. And there were two parts to that prayer, that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Um, last week I was up at the, the Kersbrook Church of Christ and I shared from that same passage and um, I talked about what it means to, uh, to know the will of God and to walk in the will of God and, and explained uh, using that passage in Romans 12 verse 2 that the, the will of God really isn't about where you should work or uh, whether or not you should become a missionary or, or any of those things. The will of God is that you live in a manner that's pleasing to him, that's acceptable to him, um, that you grow up and mature. And it was really lovely because I had a, a couple of ladies in their 80s come up to me afterwards and say, oh, for the first time in my life, I know what God's will for my life is. That's fantastic. Never, never too old to learn. But this is God's will for your life, that you, you walk in a manner that's worthy of him. Um, that's his first prayer. The second prayer was that they would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified them to share in the inheritance of the saints. Uh, that's a, a beautiful uh, little end to the prayer there. But his prayer, he, he clearly sees now that the church is growing and maturing, um, that there will be a time of testing. So his prayer is that they will be strengthened with all power so that they can endure and that they can be patient, but that they would endure it joyfully knowing that whatever comes their way, uh, their salvation is secure in Christ. Um, what is it that the Colossians have to give thanks for? Well, you finish um, with verses 13 and 14. Uh, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. This is the reason why... Uh, in our church tradition, we come back and celebrate communion every week. Uh, we need to be reminded. We need to make sure we never forget the redemption that we have in Christ. Because that's what gives us the joy that we need to endure. 
So having given us this beautiful little summary of what Christ has done for us, he now breaks out in this next passage into what has been described by some as a hymn of worship. Whether it really is a hymn or not is hotly debated. It, it makes no difference to us whether it is or not. Um, but I'll read now from um, Colossians chapter 1, verses uh, 15 to 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church." He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Uh, what glorious words. Um, it sounds a little bit like a hymn. Uh, it's certainly good material if you want to write a hymn sometime. Um, this glorious gospel that Paul preaches, well, here's a great summary of it. You can hear, uh, even in this translation, that this is, this is a single sentence. You get a sense in Paul's letters that sometimes he, he, he gets a little bit excited and some of his sentences just roll on and on and on. It's the single thought as uh, one thing flows into the next. It's oh, the wrong one. Just a sec. Uh, he is the image of the invisible God. Uh, think about that for a minute. Is there something a little bit strange in those words? How can you be the image of something that's invisible? Uh, Well, I think there's a helpful little hint for us here. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? It doesn't really mean that you look like God. Uh, In the ancient world, the image of God can mean really two things. It can mean the king, who is often described as the image and likeness of a particular deity, Or, um, the most common way the word is used is it's a statue. We're told all all of the time in the Old Testament about um, false images. Uh, In Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Um, the image of a God is, a, is the representation of the God, not simply a representation in terms of this is what the God looks like, but it represents the reign and rule of that God in that place. Now, we're told in Genesis chapter 1 that we were made to be the image and likeness of God. He made us to represent him and to rule over the creation on his behalf. Um, But God's image in Genesis chapter 1 is not a statue, it's living and breathing. And instead of putting the image into the sanctuary of a temple, uh, the image of God is placed in a garden. Now having said that, there is language in this description of that garden that makes it sound a bit like a temple. In uh, Genesis chapter 2, it talks about the rivers A river flowed from the garden, um, sorry, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. Now these three things, gold, aromatic, resin 
and onyx all have something in common. They're all items that were used in the temple. Uh, gold was used to overlay a lot of the carvings and, and different artefacts that were used in the temple. Aromatic resins, uh, a resin is like the sap of a tree, so aromatic resins, they're, they're smelly resins. Uh, frankincense and myrrh, uh, aromatic resins, uh, used in worship, which represent the prayers of the people as they rise up to God. Um, onyx, I think onyx is one of the stones used in the breastplate that the high priest wore, but there are also two, two st stones of onyx. If that, that's a bit of a... Anyway, two onyxes, which had the names of the 12 tribes of Israel carved into them. Uh, and they stood in the temple. So, so the garden is, is really being depicted as a temple. The image of God is in the sanctuary. Um, later on in Israel's history, when they, they in fact have a temple, there's something quite unique about the temple in Jerusalem compared with temples that you would find elsewhere in the world, and that is that in the sanctuary there is no image. Well, why not? Well, because God made us to be his image, but sin has made it so that there is no one fit to serve as God's image. So if you were able to go into the Holy of Holies, what would you find in the place you would expect to find the image? Well, what you would find is a box called the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the box you would find the law. There is no one able to stand as God's image and so God represents himself through his word and through law. But Paul tells us now that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. In the temple, only the high priest can enter into the Holy of Holies once a year on our behalf. He can represent us to God. He can represent sinful humanity to God, but he can't remain there. He can't represent God to us. But now for the first time since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, there is an image fit for purpose. Christ fulfills the role for which God made us all. He is the king, the perfect representative, the one who speaks the words of God and acts on God's behalf, reigning and ruling over all creation. So he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Um, if you ever have the Jehovah's Witnesses knock on your door and they want to talk to you about the origins of Christ, they'll often point to verses like this. He was the firstborn. That means that Jesus has a beginning. Well, next time they come and knock on your door, see if you can remember this. Now, most of the time, firstborn literally means the first one born. But not always. Uh, psalm 89 is a psalm about the covenant that God made with David. Do you remember that covenant? 2 Samuel chapter 7. That's one of those passages of the old scripture that you should have etched into your brain. You know where to go and look for it. Um, part of the covenant goes like this. Uh, God speaking uh, through uh, Nathan, isn't it? Through Nathan the prophet to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now, those words are echoed in Psalm 2, the coronation psalm. Uh, words that were read out to every king as the crown was placed on their head. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, Psalm 89 is about God's covenant with David and with his descendants. And um, in this psalm it says... You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. And then as we get down to verses 26 and 27, it says this. He shall cry to me, you are my father. 
my God and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. You see, firstborn doesn't always mean the first one born. David was the youngest of his brothers, but God will appoint him the firstborn, the one who will inherit the throne. God's own son. So he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation doesn't in any way imply that Jesus has a beginning. It means that Jesus is the one appointed by God to reign. Jesus is God's king. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. You almost need to stop and take a deep breath to try and absorb all of that, don't you? By him all things were created. Um, Literally says in him. Uh, Is this depicting Jesus as the instrument of creation? Uh, John 1 tells the same story but uses different words, doesn't it? Uh, Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke, and it came into being. So in John chapter 1, we hear this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the Word. He is the one through whom God created Everything. Uh, In him, this this little phrase, it's a very significant little phrase for Paul, and not just Paul, you actually find it in most of the New Testament writers. Uh, In this little passage, uh, in him all things were created. In verse 17, in him all things hold together. And in verse 19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Did you know that this little phrase, in him is the most common way that the New Testament describes what it means to be a Christian. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Or in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Jesus is the source of our life. We live in him. Uh, But what's interesting here that it's not just us, it's not just those who are being saved, the whole creation has its origin and its life in him. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Uh, Sounds like Genesis 1 again, doesn't it? In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Visible and invisible, the, the physical and the immaterial. Uh, This is probably a way that Paul is saying to the Colossians who live in a very polytheistic world that they're surrounded by other gods. Well, even if there are other gods, if there are angels and demons, he made them too. So why would you give your attention to them instead of to him? Thrones and dominions, rulers and authorities, some want to divide these into two categories and suggest that thrones and dominions refer to heavenly powers, um, the invisible, rulers and authorities to earthly powers, the visible, maybe. Um, It makes little difference. The point is that all of them, whether visible or invisible, they were all made by him. So they matter... Don't simply dismiss them as irrelevant, but they don't matter more than him. And they are all subject to him. All things were made through him. Well, that kind of summarises everything that's been said so far. Uh, But then he adds a little bit at the end. All things were made 
for him. He is not only the source of all creation, he is the goal of all creation. When you think about it, you could actually say something similar about Adam. Before sin came into the world, before humanity was broken, it was made for him, wasn't it? Was it made through him? Well, there is a sense in which the story of creation is about God overcoming the darkness, the emptiness and the chaos, which he does by his word. And humanity is then commissioned by God to go on doing that own creational work of overcoming the darkness, the emptiness and the chaos by, first of all, listening to that word and living by it and then speaking that word. But Christ is the fulfilment of all of God's purposes for humanity. He is the true image. He is the true Son of God. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Uh, Before, in front of all things. This can be understood in a couple of ways. It could simply mean that he comes first. Um, But before all things, well, in front of all things is exactly where you would expect to see the image. Everyone gathers together in the presence of God and the image of God is there in front of us. In him all things hold together. Is Jesus the glue that holds the universe together? Uh, Probably this thought is connected with what comes next. Um, He is before all things and him all things hold together and he is the head of the body, the church. Uh, How does all things holding together connect uh, with the head? Well, there's some very clear parallel language in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, where Paul writes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Certainly within the church, we understand that Christ holds all things together. He is the one that unites us to each other and makes us um, a whole, the body that functions together. Um, Head, it's a bit disputed about whether head means source or authority. It can mean both in Greek. Those things are not mutually exclusive. There's no reason why it can't be both. Um, I pointed out while we were having communion that the language in Ephesians 4 and 5 describing Christ and the church and husbands and wives is borrowed straight out of Leviticus chapter 1. So Christ as the head is the sacrifice, or at least the first part that is severed so that the whole thing can then be presented wholly and without blemish before God as the sacrifice. Uh, Sacrifice is true authority. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The beginning here translates the Greek word arche, um, can mean first or it can mean chief. Uh, You've heard of an archangel. He is the most important, the the chief, uh, the one who's been given authority. Firstborn from the dead. Uh, Firstborn uh, takes up both meanings here, the first to rise from the dead. So in a sense, he's the firstborn kind of in a literal sense. But the primary idea here is that uh, he has preeminence over all things. This is about his kingship, that in everything he might be preeminent. Christ, as the firstborn from the dead, takes up his position at the right hand of the Father. So you hear uh, Peter's words when he speaks to the crowds on the day of Pentecost and declares to them that this Jesus whom you crucified God has made both Lord and Christ by his resurrection from the dead. So, so far everything that Paul has been talking about is a description of who Christ is 
and what Christ has done. And now we move into a description, of, uh, sorry, of who Christ is. And now we start seeing what it is that Christ has done. Uh, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his Christ, uh, of his cross. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This language seems to be picking up Old Testament imagery of the glory of God filling the temple. Or in fact, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth. There are echoes here again of John's gospel. Echo isn't quite, quite the right way of saying it because John's gospel is written after, but you get what I mean. Um, in John chapter 2, when Jesus cleanses the temple, uh, they ask him, by what authority do you do this? And he answers, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up in three days? But then John adds a little bit of information for us. He was speaking about the temple of his body. Uh, in John chapter 14, Philip says to Jesus, Lord, sh show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus responds by saying, Have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Or do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The Father indwells the Son so that through him all things are reconciled to him, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I'm not sure that this necessarily means that Jesus makes peace with all of the principalities and powers and so on. But what it does mean is that Jesus uh, is reconciled in that he is placed on the throne and it's made clear to everybody who is Lord. The result of Christ's work of reconciliation... is that we have a glorious hope. Just as you and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled by his blood of flesh, by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Just as in the sacrifices, the head of the animal is severed to make way for the cleansing of the body, so the death of the Christ, who is the head of the church, which is his body, it results in the cleansing of our sin. So that just as the sacrifices are then presented holy and without blemish to God, you can be presented holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Now, this glorious description of Jesus and his work finishes with a subtle word of warning to the Colossians in verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister... The message is simple and straight to the point. Christ is all. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, so stay away from all of the other false images. He is the firstborn over all creation, so you owe him your allegiance. By him all things were created. He alone holds the power to give life, so don't go looking for it elsewhere. He is the head of the church. He gave himself in sacrifice to make you clean, so keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. There is no other way. There is only Christ. Christ is all. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that Jesus is all that we need. Thank you that by his resurrection from the dead, you have appointed him to the highest place. 
Thank you that his sacrifice has made it possible for us to enter into your presence. And we long for that glorious day when we will stand in your presence and see you face to face, when we will know even as we are fully known. Help us to rejoice in this hope in all of the circumstances of life. Never let us take our eyes off the hope that you have prepared for us. And thank you for the gift of your Son, who is all 